titled Quantum Spectrum Testing, uh, and this is joint work with Ryan O'Donnell. Uh, unfortunately, this paper is currently not available on the archive, but um, as of this morning, it is on Ryan's website, so if you're interested in what I'm talking about, want to read more about it, um, go to Ryan's page for now. Okay, so let me just tell you about the uh, kind of general problems that we're looking at in this paper. So suppose you have some sort of experimental apparatus, right? It's uh, pictured there, and maybe it has a button on top. And whenever you press this button, it outputs some mixed state, okay? So this mixed state, its name is rho. Um, you represent it as a matrix. Um, and in this talk, I'll be using lowercase d for the dimension of this matrix, okay? So rho sits inside um, the space of d by d complex matrices, okay? And maybe, I don't know, someone gave this experimental apparatus to you, you didn't construct it yourself, so you don't actually know what it does. So um, whenever you press this button, it outputs always the same row, but you don't actually know what row is, okay? And that's kind of a problem. You'd, you'd like to figure out what this experimental apparatus does. Okay, but maybe you've done, I don't know, some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of theoretical guesswork and you have some sort of intuition about what row either is or what properties it might have. For example, you might suspect that um, row equals sigma for some fixed known sigma. So maybe you actually think you know um, what mixed state is output by your apparatus. Or maybe you don't have so much intuition. Um, maybe you suspect some other thing about rho. Maybe that it has low von Neumann entropy, or maybe that it has low rank. Okay, it's a low rank matrix. And all these things would be nice to know about uh, your mixed state. Okay, so you have these suspicions, and now your problem is, well, you'd like to confirm these suspicions to tell whether they're true. Okay, so the question that we'll be looking at in this talk is, you know, how do you check your, your predictions? And the answer, the, the right framework, the right model um, to, to do this checking with is in this model of property testing of mixed states. Okay, so what is, what is property testing of mixed states? Um, it, it was a model that was proposed in this uh, property testing survey from last year, or two years ago, I guess, um, by Montanaro and DeWolf. And what you're given is the ability to generate independent copies of your mixed state row. Okay, you can generate as many as you want, um, just at the press of that button. And you want to know, does your row satisfy some property P? Or maybe, if it doesn't satisfy, is it far from satisfying um, your property P? And as always in, in the model, we have some sort of resource constraint. Here, what we think of, um, every time you, you run your apparatus, it's, it's a very expensive operation. Producing independent copies of your mixed state is expensive, so we'd like to minimize the number of copies used, but still figure out whether you have the property in question, okay? And as usual in property testing, um, we only care about the, the, the copy complexity. We, we get to ignore issues of computational efficiency, although the algorithms that we um, look at in our paper, they all happen to be efficient computationally. Okay, so um, in this paper, our paper is titled um, Quantum Spectrum Testing. So that, that means that the, the properties that we look at of our mixed states will only depend on the spectrum, the eigenvalues of the mixed state. Okay, so let me, let me just give you uh, a list of interesting properties to consider. Um, for example, the, the most basic one, testing whether a, a row, the unknown row, equals a given sigma. Wh whether, you know, you have a prediction of what row is, testing whether it actually matches that prediction is not a property of the spectrum. Because, you know, th this depends both on the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, okay? Not just the eigenvalues. An example of a spectral property is whether your, your matrix has low von Neumann entropy. Because your von Neumann entropy is just the, the entropy of, uh, of your eigenvalues, okay? So that only depends on your spectrum. Another thing that only depends on your spectrum is whether or not um, your unknown mixed state has low rank. Because, you know, you have low rank if you have a small number of non-zero uh, uh, eigenvalues. An, uh, an example, another example of um, a property of spectrum is whether your row, uh, your unknown row is diagonal in the computational basis. Uh, this of course depends on your eigenbases, okay? Unfortunately for us, actually, so I said testing whether you're equal to um, a, a, un, a given uh, density matrix sigma, in general this is not a property just of your spectrum, but in the very case when sigma is the maximally mixed state, so the state which is uh, diagonal and has one over D all the way down its diagonal. Um, so it's the identity divided by D. This thing is actually, um, this property depends only on your spectrum. Because if you are the maximally mixed state, this means that your, your eigenvalues are all one over D, okay? You have one over D, D times. So uh, 
we only, in our paper, consider things in the left column. Actually, we will only look at the first and the third. Um, whether, whether you have low von Neumann entropy, it's a little more complicated. Um, so we, we didn't look at it in this paper. Okay, so yeah, generally when you do property testing, you wanna tell, am I, do I satisfy the property or am I far from satisfying the property? To talk about you know, being far from satisfying a property, we need some sort of distance metric on uh, mixed states. And since we're only looking at properties of, of spectra, uh, we would like our, our distance metric to somehow only depend on, on the, the spectrum of um, our states, okay? So yeah, let's look, we can take our spectral decomposition of our mixed state row. Um, it's the sum of D terms because it's in D dimensional space. Uh, you have the eigenvalues here, the eta i's, and the eigenvectors are the psi sub i's. And because it's a, a mixed state, you have that the sum of the eigenvalues is one. Okay, and they're all positive, of course. Um, so this spectrum induces a probability distribution over the psi sub i's, okay? So your, your spectrum is a probability distribution. Now if we had another mixed state sigma, and it has spectrum lambda, so lambda one through lambda d, um, and we'd like to figure out how close is rho to sigma, or how close are their spectra, at least. Okay, well the natural thing to do is, uh, because these spectra are probability distributions, the natural um, notion of a distribution on, on probability, or sorry, distance on probability distributions is just total variation distance. Okay, so the distance measure we will use is this thing, um, you can think of it as the spectral distance between uh, two matrices. It's just basically you, you take the total variation distance of of uh, their spectra. There's some annoyance because you know your spectrum is an unordered multiset, so you have to pick the ordering of the spectra to minimize the total variation distance, um, but it's basically the natural thing you would try, okay? So now I can tell you the model of quantum spectrum testing. Uh, so in quantum spectrum testing, we have a tester uh, for some property P. Our tester is going to be a quantum algorithm, and when it's given n copies of the mixed state row, um, it's supposed to do the following thing. Um, it's going to distinguish between cases one and two. So in case one, um, we want it to output yes when rho has property P, so when, you're, when your mixed state has a property you're, lo you're looking for. And um, we'd like it to distinguish between that case and the case when your unknown mixed state is at least epsilon far from every sigma which satisfies the property P. Okay, so either you have the property P or you're epsilon far in this spectrum distance um, from satisfying the property P. Another way of looking at this, this second condition just says that no matter how you rearrange epsilon um, fraction of the, of the uh, spectrum, you'll still not satisfy the property. Okay. Um, and it's always the goal here is to minimize n, the number of copies you use. So maybe, maybe the second thing looks a little weird to you just because we have this somewhat unusual distance metric. Um, you might prefer to instead use this uh, second condition where maybe you, you would rather say no whenever the trace distance between, or you, you would rather, um, yeah, to, to demand of your algorithm that it says no whenever the trace distance between rho and sigma is at least epsilon for every sigma which satisfies the property P. So instead of um, the spectral distance, you, you would like the trace distance there. And it turns out that in our specific case, these two things are equivalent. Although this fact is somewhat not obvious. Uh, it uses some, some deep theorem and matrix analysis, okay? But for us it will be, um, um, so you might find the second one to be more familiar, but the first one is more convenient for, for thinking about these types of problems. Okay, so this is a quantum testing problem, but um, it, it turns out that there's a very natural classical testing problem, which has been very well studied, which this is extremely related to, okay? And that's the problem of, of testing properties of probability distributions. So let me just tell you how, what the link between these two looks like. So we have our unknown mixed state rho. But let's say someone came to you and actually told you the eigenbasis of rho, okay? They, they told you what all these psi sub i's are. So you wanna test some property of rho, you know it's eigenbasis. The natural thing to do is just to measure in this basis. Um, in which case you will actually uh, receive psi i, the, eigen, the i th uh, eigenvector with probability a to i, okay? In other words, you actually um, are given sample access to, uh, to the, the spectrum, okay? The spectrum of, is a probability distribution. If you knew the eigenbasis, you could actually sample from this distribution. So in this case, we wanna test properties of the spectrum. We're given samples from the spectrum. And as I said, 
um, you know, the spectrum is a probability distribution. So we've reduced, in this one case, our problem to testing properties of some probability distribution given samples from this probability distribution. Okay, and this is exactly the, the problem that's considered in the model of property testing proper probability distributions. So here there's some unknown distribution D and you wanna test a property of it. Maybe it's uniform, does it have high entropy? The most natural thing to do here is just to take a ton of samples, um, look at the empirical distribution given by your sample and then use that as a proxy for D. Okay, and, and this, this strategy tends to work um, when n is, is linear in the number of elements that your probability distribution is over. So when n is linear in D, then your empirical distribution is a good approximation for the underlying distribution, in which case you can basically solve any property testing problem you want because you can approximate your distribution. So then the question people ask in this area is can we do better than linear? So one of the most basic results in this area was by Paninsky in 2008 who showed that um, if I wanna test whether my distribution is uniform or epsilon far from uniform, this requires and is sufficient to only use root D queries, okay? So linear is easy, but we can also do um, sublinear. We can do square root D. Uh, so this is kind of the most basic result. It, this was generalized actually last year um, to testing equality to any known distribution using also root D over epsilon squared samples by uh, the Valiant brothers. And um, there, there are various other algorithms and results dealing with testing things like support size, entropy, and so on, okay? So it's a very well studied area, very successful. Okay, so uh, now let me tell you about some prior um, work and, and our results. We have uh, like four different results, so I'll, I'll kind of intersperse them throughout the prior work. So um, first let me start just with some useful algorithms that you might try to throw at this problem. Most basic thing you might try, well, I wanna tell if rho has some property or not, so let's just estimate it. Okay, this is, this is called tomography, um, and it's known that it's a, a very simple fact that if I wanna estimate my matrix rho up to epsilon accuracy, this time in, in trace distance, then I only need um, d to the fourth over epsilon squared copies, okay? So d to the fourth copies. Actually, I'm missing a log d there, but that's not so important. Um, of course, this, this is kind of overkill if we're doing quantum spectrum testing because I don't really care about the whole matrix. I only care about the spectrum. So one thing you might try is, well, is there a better algorithm um, just to estimate the spectrum and not the whole matrix? And um, indeed there is. This is what we call the EYD algorithm for reasons I won't get into, um, which estimates a spectrum of an unknown mixed state using only D squared samples or copies. Um, okay, so we reduce d to the fourth down to d squared. This algorithm, it's kind of implicit in this earlier work of Aliki et al, and it was proposed explicitly by uh, Kiel Werner in 2009. Okay, um, and a, a third thing that you have access to is uh, weak sure sampling. I'll get into it a little more later, but all it does is uh, it takes a spectrum, and the spectrum is a probability distribution, and it samples something that's like a histogram from this distribution. Um, not quite a histogram, but it's something we call a, a shifted histogram. I'll get into that more later. Let's focus on this, this, second, uh, this second algorithm, the EYD algorithm. Uh, and this is where we get our first theorem. So our, our first result is, has two parts. First, we give a new proof, new in quotation marks, of, this, uh, of the upper bound, the d squared over epsilon squared upper bound. Why I say new is because it overlaps, uh, half of it overlaps significantly with with other, um, other proofs, but I think the other part that does not overlap is conceptually a lot simpler and more, more straightforward. And we complement this with a lower bound that shows indeed this particular algorithm does require d squared over epsilon squared copies of the mixed state. Okay, so if you wanna, there might be another algorithm that does better, but um, this algorithm requires a quadratic number of samples, copies. Okay. Um, so at least what does this EYD algorithm tell us? Well, if we're testing spectra and we can estimate your spectrum using quadratic number of samples, this means spectrum testing is easy um, using a quadratic number of, of samples. So uh, you, you might wonder, well, what, what about uh, subquadratic algorithms? I mean, that's kind of our goal now. And there's actually a, subquadr a subquadratic algorithm that's uh, already been uh, shown for a problem that isn't exactly in this property testing model, but is, is uh, superficially very similar to it. 
Um, and this is an algorithm that solves this problem that I will call QB day. I think of this as kind of a, a quantum version of the birthday paradox. So in this problem, your goal is to distinguish between um, the following two, two cases. In the first case, uh, your, your density matrix rho is maximally mixed, um, meaning that its spectrum is uniform, so d things all one over d, versus case two, when your uh, matrix is maximally mixed, but only on a subspace of dimension d over two. Um, in other words, your, your uh, spectrum is uniform on half of its entries, on d over two, and zero on everything else. And a result of uh, Childs et al., I think in 2006, showed that for this particular problem of distinguishing these two things, um, it's both necessary and sufficient to use a linear number of copies, okay? So using d copies is necessary and sufficient to solve this problem. So on the one hand, this is nice because it gives you some sort of subquadratic algorithm for a testing-like problem. And on the other hand, well, they had a linear lower bound here, and it turns out that for many testing problems in, in the model we look at, this particular QB day problem is a special case. So th these linear lower bounds translate into linear lower bounds for a lot of testing problems, like testing if you're maximally mixed, testing if you have low entropy, low rank, and so on. Okay, so now our second result. Um, we consider a variant of this problem, which I'll call QB day prime, just for here, in which you want to distinguish between, the first case will stay the same, but in the second case, you, you replace the subspace being on dimension d over two to being d minus one. Okay, so this means that um, now your spectrum in the second case is, max is uniform on d minus one entries and is zero on the last one, okay? So this is just like the, the original problem, except it's harder, right? The, the two things are closer to each other. And our, our second theorem is just um, that we show for this problem, d squared, and instead of d, d squared copies are both necessary and sufficient, okay? So we show that for a harder problem, we, 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 uh, we, we consider a natural harder variant of this, and we get a harder lower bound, okay? And this is nice because it gives lower bounds for, for some other problems, just as the first result did. And we, we interpolate between these two results, okay? Instead of d minus one, you could do d minus two, d minus root d, whatever. We get um, basically tight bounds for everything in between. Okay, so that's our first two results. And now let me just tell you our final two results, which both occupy the space of th this property testing stuff. So um, our first result is that to, to test whether my uh, mixed state is maximally mixed, so its uh, spectrum is the uniform distribution, then d over epsilon squared copies um, are both necessary and sufficient, okay? And um, our second, or sorry, our final theorem just to is, is uh, to test whether my unknown mixed state has rank R, so it only has R non-zero eigenvalues. Uh, both R squared, sorry, R squared over epsilon samples are both necessary and sufficient for this as well, okay? At least with one-sided error. And I'm not gonna go into uh, two-sided error here. Okay, so I've given you four results. I kind of think of this, this top one as our main result. Uh, and yeah, anyway, so yeah, that's what we show. Okay, so now let me, l let me show you the main tool, which is this weak sure sampling, or the, the main algorithmic core. Okay, so wh what did I say earlier? I said that weak sure sampling, it does something called sampling from a shifted histogram. Um, from from the spectrum. Uh, so I'll get into that in a second, but basically this means you have this this box called weak sure sampling. You put in n copies of your state row, and it will output something called a, a, a shifted histogram, which I'll name by lambda. Okay, in the box is where all the quantum stuff happens. So it applies some unitary operator, does some quantum measurement, and the information you get on the right is purely classical. Okay, so now um, in our paper, we only consider algorithms of this form. You're given n copies of rho, you measure this lambda, you, you get this shifted histogram using weak sure sampling, and you base your decision, uh, yes or no, entirely on the lambda that you get. Okay, Okay, so this can kind of be view viewed as a canonical algorithm. Um, and why is this? It's because this result of Childs et al. from 2006 uh, implicit in, in what they showed is that this algorithm is optimal for any quantum spe spectrum testing problem. So anytime you care about uh, um, only the spectrum of your state, you might as well use this weak sure sampling. Okay, so um, let me explain to you what a shifted histogram is. This is. I'm only using this terminology for this talk. I, for those in the know, a shifted histogram is just a Young diagram, um, and it comes from representation theory. But uh, for here, it's you know nice to think of it just as a histogram. 
So w with a, a normal histogram, you know, you're given samples from some probability distribution, and uh, whenever you see a sample i, you put a box in the ith column, okay? And then you get some sort of uh, set of columns that, that tell you how many times you've seen each sample. A shifted histogram is just one in which whenever you see i, um, sometimes you accidentally mistake it for one of one through i minus one. So you mistake it for something smaller, okay? Um, you would like not to make a mistake, but that's how things go. Okay, so just as an example, we'll say we're given this sample, it's sampled from some um, probability distribution. Then the histogram that you'd see is just, well, there are two ones, there's one, two, one, three, two fours, and two fives. Okay, so that's a histogram. Now let's go through what does the shifted histogram look like? Okay. So um, we start off with one, where, wha where do we put the box? Well, we can't, there's nothing smaller than it, so we can't mistake it for anything. So we stick the box in the first column. Two, we could mistake it for one, because one is smaller than two. Maybe we make no mistake, we put that in the second column. But now we get to four. Four, we would like to put in the fourth column, but we could also mistake it for one through three. And for just some magical reason, well, um, we accidentally mistake it for a two. Okay, so we put a box in the second column where we meant a, a box in the fourth column. Similarly, we get to five. We want to put it in, in five, but accidentally we put the box in the second column. We do this for all of them, okay? Um, so we, what, what we'd really like is a histogram on the left. What we get is sh the shifted histogram on the right. Um, and how should you think of it? You should think of taking the histogram and like applying some force on it from the right uh, and then getting this thing on, uh, on, on the right, okay? So I've just been kind of uh, nebulous on how these mistakes occur. There's some precise pattern um, that defines how they occur and it's given by this thing called the RSK algorithm, which is a very well-known combinatorial algorithm. It turns out that um, the more samples you have, the fewer mistakes are made, which just makes means that if you take a ton of samples, your shifted histogram looks like the normal histogram, which is pretty great. Okay, so weak sure sampling then. Um, what does this algorithm do? I'm not gonna tell you how it works, but I will tell you what it outputs, which is uh, you take your unknown mixed state row. It has eigenvalues one through D, which, which define a probability distribution. So the output distribution of weak sure sampling is this. You take this probability distribution induced by your spectrum and you sample it n times, okay? You get a sample x and instead of giving you the histogram, which is what you'd really like, you're given the shifted histogram, okay? Uh, cool. So let me just define SW sub n of rho just to be this output distribution. It's a, a random variable that you get. Okay, and just some, uh, a couple of examples. Um, in the case when D is one comma zero zero zero, uh, whenever you sample it, your histogram looks like this. When you push from the right, you can't move it over any, any further. So your shifted histogram is always the same as a histogram. In the more interesting case, when, you're, when you have the maximally mixed state, your, sorry, your, your distribution is all one over D. So when you get a histogram, it looks something like this, you know, D columns all of N over D. Just so happens when you, when you take the shifted histogram of this, you get this sort of ice cream cone-like shape, okay? You, you push a ton of stuff in the first column, but some stuff is left over and you, and you get a very nice curve. Okay, so the summary so far, okay. Um, we have this canonical algorithm called weak sure sampling. It outputs a random shifted histogram. This distribution has some sort of combinatorial explanation for how it works. And um, what we'll do is try to carry over some intuition from the histogram to the shifted histogram. Okay, so, you know, we don't have the histogram, but let's pretend like we had access to it. That, that's kind of the strategy. So let me just tell you quickly, how, how do we test mixedness? When you're testing mixedness, you'd like to distinguish between the case when eta is uniform versus eta is epsilon far from uniform. So your spectrum I here is eta. And the idea is, you know, the histogram, if you were uniform, um, is totally flat, okay? So maybe you might hope that the shifted histogram is also as flat as possible, okay? In which case, the way you distinguish between these two cases, you just, if you see a flat histogram, you say yes. If it doesn't look flat, you say no. Okay, so for some notation, uh, lambda i, l let's write lambda i for the block, the number of blocks in the i-th column. You'd expect, one, one way to tell if you're flat is just to um, say you're flat if p2 of lambda defined as sum over i of lambda i squared if that's small, okay? Um, can I, maybe the next speaker could come up and I can just finish. I'm almost done, I have like two more slides. Um, but yeah, if the next speaker wants to start setting up, that'd be 
Anyway, so we could say you're flat I if you're. Um, okay. Um, for some technical reasons, we use some other polynomial, whatever. Um, so yeah, the goal. Um, so we'd like to show in these two two cases. In one case, uh, when you are maximally mixed, that, that your P2 of lambda tends to be small. In the other case, it tends to be large. So you want to look at the, the expectation of this, this polynomial. Unfortunately, there, there are no formulas for these poly polynomials. Um, this may not be so much of a problem when you're looking at P2. But um, for one of our lower bounds, we have to look at this very crazy looking sum, which deals with P2 all the way up to P infinity. Um, Okay, so we need we need to know how to take expectations, and basically the idea is uh, we we start using some some uh, pretty recent math from from representation theory of the symmetric group um, called Kirov's algebra of observables. So what he studied is these polynomial functions and the parameters. Okay, and so these P two the P K polynomials are one of them. Turns out there are other families of polynomial functions, and they all tell you different things about um, about your shifted histograms. There are various conversion formulas between these polynomials, and what's nice is that this P-sharp polynomial, you can compute expectations according to it. Okay, so at a high level, our proof, you start with the P-K polynomials, you, you want to find an expectation of them, switch to P-sharp, and uh, then you can take an expectation. I'm leaving out a ton of details, um, but yeah, and in conclusion, these two things, yeah, thanks for your time. Okay, thanks. Question? One question. Um, yeah, so what it does is it, it samples according to, uh, it, it basically it samples and it gets three pieces of information which come from uh, representation theory, uh, which come from sure while, um, uh, yeah, it, it gets basically three pieces of information. It throws away uh, two of them, um, and one of them turns out to be uh, a register that corresponds to the unitary group. But because because we only care about uh, I'm doing a terrible explanation, sorry. But um, since we only care about the spectrum, um, we kind of isolate out the part of when we're doing measurements, the part that does not depend on the spectrum. We can throw that away. Um, there's a strong sure sampling that. If you care about, uh, if you want to do property testing of mixed states, and uh, you don't just care about spectral properties, you care about the other properties, you might not want to use weak shear sure sampling. You might want to use strong shear sure sampling. Okay. Thanks.